Coming up on this week's show, GoldenEye is back, but is it any good? Run retro games in your browser. And we chat to Rebellion co-founder Jason Kingsley. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you every week with our great friends at Bitmap Books. Now, one of my favorite Bitmap Books books is Commodore 64, a visual compendium. Everything from Attack of the Mutant Camels to Zack McCracken, you can see why the Commodore 64 was the best games machine of the 1980s. Check that out on the rest of their retro gaming collection at bitmapbooks.com. And with our friends at PCBWay, now they offer a fully featured custom PCB prototype service. And you know they have low cost, fast turnaround quality boards, and they do services like 3D printing and injection molding. And PCBWay are huge supporters of the retro community. So if you're working on a project, you can get an instant quote right now at PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 363, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show, our first podcast of February, 2023 flying by already, and of course, lots of big retro gaming news stories to bring you up to speed on, and an incredible guest. Now, I don't want to jinx things too much, but I think we've hit the ground running in 2023 in terms of amazing guests so far. I said to the guys, I said, you've got to stop getting these good guests because, uh, you know, <laughs> it's it's already a really high standard that we've set. And I can't believe who got this guest this week. You know, Joe, he, he doesn't usually get a guest, but Thanks when he does, <laughs> oh my God. He just sits God. around all the time doing nothing, Joe, yeah. usually. But, yeah. Well, uh, you know, you guys were saying we need to get more guests. You know, I was like, right, let me see what I can do. So I reached out to a couple of people, got a couple in the pipelines, haven't we? A couple big yep. ones lined up. But this week, man, got Jason Kingsley um, of Rebellion Games, which was just like absolutely amazing. I thought I'd pop him a message and he was literally like, yeah, let's do it. Like that was it. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Send send it over. I was like, oh my God, I've got him, guys. So yeah, man, I'm really, you guys jumped on this one because I was at work, but I'm really, really, really excited to hear this because we've got, what, 30 years of rebellion yep. and you know in his kind of like beginnings in the 80s well that's the thing i mean they celebrated their 30th anniversary last month mm. so in a hell of a lot of history and uh, even going back to you know we talk about the early days when they were making games for the atari jaguar and they actually made you know what is generally most people's favorite game on the jaguar alien versus mm. predator yeah which um you know in terms of uh, there's not many good games on the jag yeah. but i think that is one of the few reasons that you might want to emulate a jaguar and then at so many other titles as well kind of running through that 30 years and of course we talk about games like you know sniper elite mm. that is obviously a massive franchise today and uh, ravi got very nerdy with him about um judge dread and well, 2008 yeah, as well. it was it was a great interview because dan has his jag kind of stuff so he got really nerdy on that and then i got really nerdy on 2000 ad because you know jason um they actually own 2000 ad now so they own the rights to a lot of the characters like rebellion did the recent judge dread film which was just absolutely excellent if you haven't seen that but um also you know he's worked on some of the great british comic book titles that have gone into video games so rogue trooper was oh, one yeah. of my absolute favorite ones he was talking about a strontium dog game that they proposed as well and for a 2000 ad fan and just a fan of british comics and uh, mm. comics in general it's just really interesting to hear that kind of development from the comic to video games and you know bringing these characters into the video game world and i think jason is actually the first knight that we've had on the retro hour. Yeah. 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 Thinking yeah. about it, he is. And he is an actual proper knight. It's like he dresses up and does all the medieval knight stuff. Yeah. He's got a uh, YouTube channel as well, uh, which has got like almost a million subs on it. It's really, I was watching it the other night. It's really, really interesting, actually. And he's a local boy uh, to us. He's from Leicester as well, which is really cool. So. He's got a book coming out as well in a couple of months' time, which is running on Kickstarter right now. So there's about three weeks left on that if you'd like to back it. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And obviously you hear more about that and everything else with Rebellion co-founder Jason Kingsley. He's coming up on the show in around half an hour from now. Now, I do just have to give um, a lot of mention to some sad news as well, because um, it's, it's always really sad when... Uh, Someone from the retro community um, is no longer with us, and uh, we did hear some very sad news over the weekend, didn't we, Ravi? Yeah, um, sadly, uh, from Pints and Amiga, which is a, a great kind of stream where you know they play along with Amiga games. Um, Taylor, who's a, an absolute great uh, personality, you know, Taylor Cork, sadly passed away, and um, 
you know, we send our condolences to him and uh, his family and his dad as well, who he would stream with. And Taylor provided a lot of energy. He was a really good streaming guy and, you know, a, a Star Trek fan. And he also loved his Amiga. Like, um, he, he was in film production and some of the setup that he had, they had this huge basement with streaming. So uh, sad to see Taylor go. Yeah, rest in peace, Taylor. And obviously, like Ravi said, our, uh, our thoughts are with Taylor's family at this difficult time. And uh, there is a really nice tribute to him, actually, in um, in Amiga Addict magazine. Well, it was actually when they did the Pants and Amiga special, didn't they? Yeah. Um, a few, about a year ago. And I know the, the guys have actually put that up for everyone and, to read and, for free. And Amiga Bill's done a stream as well, because Amiga yeah. Bill actually went and visited him in Texas and uh, yeah. went to the studio and stuff and saw them. So, uh, you know, that was really good. And you can check that on Twitch as well and YouTube. Yeah, so I'll put links to all that in the in the show notes as well. Okay, then, so let's jump into this week's news stories. And I'm very pleased that you made it onto the podcast this week, Joe, because we we, I know we had to drag you kicking and screaming away from playing GoldenEye. Um, but, of course, <laughs> it's back. And this has been the biggest story everywhere. You know, I've seen it on my Facebook timeline from newspapers. I've seen it on the TV that the N64 classic GoldenEye 007, um, something we announced on the podcast a long time ago, but it is finally here remastered and re-released on modern platforms. So I've downloaded it on Xbox Game Pass. It's on my machine. I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but I know you have been spending quite a bit of time over the weekend on GoldenEye. Yeah, I managed to... Uh, I've been on late at work. And, you know, usually when I'm on a late at work, I kind of get home, have my dinner, settle down for half an hour and I have to go to bed. And, you know, on Friday night when it came out, I was like, you know what, like... It is literally, it's it's only like 400 megabytes or something like that. It's like, you know, half a gig to download. So it is on Game Pass on Xbox, uh, on Xbox uh, and on PC. And then it's also on the Nintendo online, uh, you know, on the N64 on there. Uh, so if you've got those subscriptions, it's on there. And then obviously I think you can buy it as well. So I downloaded it and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to give this a blast. Like, let's just do it. And, you know... So far, I've seen really mixed kind of like feedback about it, like kind of mixed mm. reviews. Some people are saying it's fantastic. Some people are saying, you know, emu just emulator, it's better or whatever. You know, emulation's better than this kind of thing. Personally, I've had no issues with it. You know, um, I've not played it loads like Dan seems to think I have. <laughs> I played it <laughs> for a good hour on Friday night and then I managed to jump on it for a couple of hours this week as well. Um, I'm probably about six or seven levels into the campaign, which, you know, I'm not going to lie, I'm doing on agent. I'm just running through and having fun, just blasting everybody, you know, mm. with the uh, the Soviet AK or whatever it's called. And just, you know, kind of revisiting it now and knowing the team behind it, you know, a lot of them were behind Time Splitters, which is like one of my favorite games of all time. I can really feel it and see it now, especially with playing it with an Xbox controller rather than an N64 controller. Because, you know, the N64 controller... I love Nintendo, I love the N64, but a little bit clunky. I think it's, you know, it kind of loses a bit of its clunk playing it with the Xbox One controller, the Xbox Series X controller. Um, so, so far, I've got no issues with it. I'm really, really enjoying it. But I know there's been a few controversial videos out there, controversial opinions about it. Um, I'm loving it. I've heard mixed stuff. I've heard some people say it's like as broken as the Vice City release, which mm. I, I don't know if I can believe that because that was really, yeah. really kind of messed up. But um, and then I've heard some people say it's really good. So I'm 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 not quite sure. It's interesting that you mentioned the original team there because there's a few tweets that have gone out from the uh, OG right. team and a friend of our as a friend of the show, Graham Norgate. Um, is one of the original team, and he says, sad to see that GoldenEye for the Switch and Xbox has been outsourced to two different devs. Uh, it would have been good to get the old team back together for mm. one more gig. Uh, we wouldn't have let you down. Labors of loves are always better than cash for mates. And then uh, David Doak also says, uh, you know, obviously it's good to see GoldenEye 007 re-released, and I hope people have a lot of fun with it. But yeah, it's a bit shabby that we weren't invited. <laughs> so, you know, they, yeah. I think there's a little bit of, you know, the old team kind of wanted to get in there. And it would have made perfect sense to get them in there, to be perfectly honest, because, they're you know, they're all in the game industry, I believe, still. Or yeah, yeah, they're all still developing. Well, they're time all still split, developing. Time Splitters is, uh, you know, uh, developing yeah. a new game at the moment. Yeah, uh, with exactly. Free Radical. So yeah, so, you know, it makes sense. So that's a bit of a shame, you know, that they weren't involved and stuff like that. And Dr. Doke is still in the game, I can confirm. Um, oh, on the, at least yeah. on the Xbox version. I've not played the Switch version, but um, yeah, on the facility level, uh, the second level, he's still there in all his uh, boxy glory. 
um, and I've played multiplayer once against my wife. Absolutely slammed her at it. Um, <laughs> and uh, she, she wasn't happy and only played one game. <laughs> has it got like a online multiplayer feature? Um, I though? don't think the Xbox one no. has. I, that, this is one of the biggest complaints yeah. that I've been seeing, that it's just not as much fun to play solo. Yeah. Because the Switch version you can play online. Yeah. Okay, Because I That's think good. from... Yeah, from what I've seen, I think the Switch version's really, in many ways, it's emulating the original game, isn't it? Yeah. So the the multiplayer's in there, and the Xbox isn't. That's kind of a, a remake. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, and I've seen other complaints as well, that even though the online multiplayer aspect is present in the Switch version, the control scheme by default on the Switch is apparently terrible. Oh, really? Because on the Xbox, they remapped it really well onto the Xbox yeah, controller. it's just like card. Like, it's literally just, you know, the triggers, and then you use the bumpers to switch through your weapons, and it just plays perfect. Yeah. But luckily on the um, on the Switch version, you can remap yeah. the buttons. So, there's, I mean, I've seen quite a few videos on kind of suggested remaps, but apparently out the box... It's kind of left pretty similar to the N64 kind of scheme, which, uh, you know, when you're playing it on anything but an N64 controller, even though there are N64 controllers that you can get for the Switch, mm. you know, they're like a uh, rocking horse dung, you know, they're very hard to get. But um, if you've got one of those, I imagine that will make it more authentic. Uh, but yeah, and I mean, some of the other complaints I've seen, I mean, I was watching a, a review by Dreamcast Guy, and he said they ruined GoldenEye 007. Um, IGN gave 8.5 out of 10, and uh, Modern Vintage Gamer he made a video kind of highlighting a lot of the flaws in it as well, but said it was still a fun experience. One of the biggest complaints that I've seen that I think is just a bit bizarre is a lot of people saying that, you know, the graphics aren't very good and it's, <laughs> it's not, be, and it's not yeah, been updated. It's, it's interesting that articles just dropped on the um, Guardian uh, just today, actually, which is saying, um, should GoldenEye have stayed in the 90s? And they're talking mm. about, um, you know, some of the graphical points as well. And then they're saying, is this going to be, something that's going to go into dead space as well um which is getting a kind of remake at the moment so yeah they they're they're highlighting a few of the points i don't know if if you know this is going to get ironed out with a a patch and then all of those kind of complaints would uh, uh, go because that's what they tend to do nowadays don't they they release something as a few like niggles with it and then they patch it yeah i mean you know that that lack of multiplayer online on the xbox that seems to be the biggest omission, I think, you that see, people would like. You see, for, for me, I just associate. I, I'm not. I'm not bothered about playing it online. I associate it with like sitting down with my friends and playing it. Like for me, I see it as like you know, my mate Stevie. He's like, we've got to play it. We've got to play it with some drinks. Like I see, if you're doing the local co-op, yeah, I'm. Yeah. But that's just me. I'm. I'm retro. I'm on the retro hour, you know. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I get that, and I'm like, you know, my brother and I, we, we were playing on Xbox on Friday night, and he actually said, "Golden Eyes, actually, we play that." And I said, "No, oh, you can't online." So he's like, "Oh, I won't bother then." Mm. So I could put him off straight away downloading it. Otherwise, we would have played that, you know, instead of Call of Duty or whatever we ended up on. Um, so I think, in many ways, because you know, the people that they used to play it with as kids, a lot of people move around the country, around the world, and would like that experience with the childhood friends again if they're still in touch. Yeah. So I see that complaint. And, and, that, and that to be honest, sense. like I know people, you, you said earlier, like, oh, emulation's better. It's really hard to do. <laughs> like I've, I've tried it on the, like I love the Wii U and stuff and virtual console and you'd always have to overclock it and it still wouldn't run quite right and stuff. Maybe I haven't like gone down that path enough and there's maybe a strong, powerful emulator that works on a like multi-core, mm. you know, um, PC or something like that or on a Mac. But um yeah, I've, I've I've always thought GoldenEye was one of those titles that's really hard to emulate because it does so much special stuff in there. Yeah, it's true. And and some people have been saying as well that the, the surprise they didn't use the abandoned Xbox 360 code and gra- graphics as like a foundation. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. So obviously that, that looks a bit more modern and they're quite surprised that maybe that wasn't Maybe different used, architectures or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe the team that made it didn't have access to that. It could be something like that. And then again, I mean, you know, who are you going to please there? You know, a lot of people I think do want the original graphics, even though I've seen a lot of complaints about it. Cause it kind of changes the game quite a bit, I guess, if you're updating the graphics. Yeah, you can't please so, everyone, can you? Know? Yeah, <laughs> that's it, yeah. isn't it? And I, w- one thing that is bizarre, though, is the fact that there's no way to buy the game. Oh, can you not? From what I've seen. Oh, okay. No, I think the only way you can get it is on Xbox Game Pass on Nintendo yeah, Online. Yeah, that'd be nice, a physical copy, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. which is like, yeah, that is bizarre, whether that's something to do with, because I know... The Golden Eye, you know, the Bond kind of licensing has been a, a sticking point for a long time. Maybe it's something to do with that. So what? You can't really even sure, buy but... it like online. The digital version, you have to have the you have to have the subscription. Essentially, I haven't. Yeah, from from what I've heard, there's no way to kind of oh, go okay. onto um, yeah Xbox Game 
store and buy it off there, which seems a bit bizarre. So, you know, basically it's there as, you know, as long as they leave it online, I guess. Interesting. But um, it is nice to see games like that back. And I think, you know, because it was, it's such an iconic game. And I know it's been one of the most in-demand retro games to get an update for so long now. So, uh, and it, from, you know, what I've heard, I haven't been on it yet, but, you know, I, I trust your opinion, Joe, <laughs> and it's still the same uh, fun experience as you had back in the day. So that is good to hear. So that game is available now on our Xbox Game Pass and on Nintendo Online. Now, something else you've been playing around with, and uh, this is something that's been around for a while. And um, I did a YouTube video on featuring this a good few years ago now, but I haven't played with it for a couple of years. And it looks like it's had some nice updates, actually. And this is something called MU or EMU OS. Yeah, I I have been playing around with this. So um, I, I haven't seen your video on it. Apologies. So I will be checking that out. And uh, I, I you know implore everybody else to go have a look at that video as well. Outrageous. That Dan's done on it. But yeah, this is, it's a Windows emulation. So I first read it thinking it was like retro game emulation on your PC you know, but like in your browser, like an easy way to do it. But it, I, I wasn't quite right with that. So what what it seems to be to me, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it emulates in your browser, Windows 95, Windows 98, yeah, or it's, Windows it, ME, doesn't it? The it's kind of it. like, it's not a strict emulation. It's kind of a theme. So okay. uh, that's what I'd call it, an advanced theme, because it's in Java, JavaScript. Yeah. And, um, you know, they've they've got a start menu in there, but it's not a start menu. They've Yeah. You know they haven't got all the kind of features in there. It's it's in the style of Windows, and then they just you know put an Emmy background in there mm. or put one. But what it is is it's a games launcher. It's a games launcher for browser based kind of games, yeah. and um, it's acting as like a preservation project. Um, mm-hmm. But it's also a really quick way to access all of these titles and there's there's quite a few uh, modern titles in there actually so there's a a mix between like classic pc yeah. stuff obscure pc apps like clippy and e sheep and stuff like that but then also you know uh, some modern games as well yeah so l- like you say it it's a quick way to emulate some of these kind of like retro popular games and like you say a few newer ones as well my pc is far from a powerhouse house and i was running it in the browser absolutely fine um i was playing doom one and two uh, on there earlier today but yeah there's doom one two three wolfenstein 3d quake one to three street fighter alpha lemmings command and conquer red alert diablo half-life um, but then like you say there's minecraft on there um there's even some pokemon bits and even flappy bird is on there so stuff as well. like yeah cut the rope as well and cut the rope of, yeah uh, some of the modern com- ones fruit ninja yeah, stuff like that. Some some of the more modern. Well, I say modern. They're probably about ten years old all of them now. But <laughs> yeah, that's modern for us, modern to us. But yeah, no, I I thought it ran really really well. But it's interesting here that it's not kind of like real emulation. It's like a JavaScript. But you know, yeah. Well, what what they've kind of done is is it they've they've got this collection of classic games as well. So you know, I've love I love the selection. You've got like Worms Armageddon. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, Tomb Raider's on there. Tomb Raider, yeah, Tomb yeah. Raider, Unreal yeah. Tournament. Unreal Tournament, UFO, Enemy Unknown, and stuff. So it's a, it's a wicked site, but I think they've kind of put it up there without um, a, a kind of copyright, and they've they've got in the form. So as soon as you start, they've got like legal issues, and then they've got um, DMCA takedown notices and removal requests. So they're very aware that they're putting stuff out there that's um, kind of copyrighted, but they're saying if this is your work then, you know, contact us and we'll take it off. So yeah. I guess the thing is they're hoping that people aren't going to notice or they're just going to go, oh, this is just a way to kind of play it. I think there may be, be an issue with the Command and Conquer stuff because that's just been remade. Maybe the company would be, like, annoyed with that. Doom, a lot of it's uh, open source port, same with mine- yeah. Minecraft as well. There's, and Quake was open sourced. Yeah, there's well. loads of versions of Minecraft as well. Yeah, so I mean, there could be issues with that. I mean, it's kind of like archive.org, isn't it? You know, when they put games up there, they're like, you know, if you want us to take it down, we will. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. basically a disclaimer there. And, you know, most of them on here are like, you know, 30-year-old games at least, a lot of them. Interestingly, there are some uh, shortcuts that they put on the, the launcher as well, but, you know, like Joe was saying, looks a bit like Windows 9X. There is um, a shortcut there to Windows 93, which is a, a similar kind of site that's been around for a long time. It's kind of got more games and weird applications hosted on there with a very kind of trippy... Um, Windows 9X theme on there. And there is a Windows 98 emulator that they bundle in here as well that launches separately in JavaScript. 
So if you actually want to you know, emulate Windows 98 on your modern machine um, in your web browser, you can do that from here as well. So, um, I mean, yeah, like, like you were saying, Ravi, it's basically just a, a glorified launcher, isn't it? But yeah. it is a nice way to have all of these together no, I'm, in one place. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking the one thing that's going to get them in trouble is Mario. <laughs> they've got in the middle and they've got oh, Mario on there as well. Super Mario Bros. <laughs> and I'm like, Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, if you want to check that out, a um, good way to play these retro games um, on your office PC, I guess, while you're at work, if you want to look busy. Uh, oh, Ski Freeze on there. Love that game. So I'll, uh, I'll link it up in our show notes at the retro hour.com and now while you're talking about nintendo uh what about this this is going to get on their radar i'm sure zelda a link to the past has been reverse engineered so that means that now you could run this on your pc and also it means that apparently ports to other systems might be possible so you could have you know zelda a link to the past on uh, on the mega drive potentially God, I don't know if the Mega Drive can run it. <laughs> <laughs> Sega Saturn, maybe? Sega Saturn, yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, so we've seen a few of these in the last couple of years. Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, um, some of the GTA games, you know, have all kind of been reverse engineered. And I, I've had to kind of get my head around this because, like, I'm a little bit just like, well, why can't you just emulate it? Like, that gets it to run on the PC? Because the whole point of it is it's like you reverse engineer it and then it runs, like, natively on the PC. And you're yeah, like... Yeah. And you're just like, okay, well, what's the difference with that with emulation? But obviously, I'm kind of reading into it. And emulation is it's it makes your PC think it's running the console. And when you kind of have it running on your PC natively, it means you can, you can pretty much you can tweak it. You can get it to run in widescreen and you can do little patches and mods and stuff like that on it. Um, and there's a really cool side-by-side -side video of this Link to the Past um, port, if you will, where, where it's the port versus the emulation. And actually, you know, when you put it side-by-side, it is actually quite amazing to kind of watch it, you know, like it's very, very subtle differences, but it clearly looks a bit nicer, a little bit brighter in some of the colours and stuff like that. But as well as that, it just gen generally kind of like runs a little bit quicker, but not so much that it's like altering the game. It's just more kind of like quality of life adjustments. So like the transitions between screens are quicker, the text scrolling from the characters in the games is quicker. Um, and then also you can hold two items rather than one item at a time. Oh, that must be a blessing, is it, rather than having to go into the inventory? Yeah, box. so yeah. It, like I say, it's kind of those like quality of life kind of like, you know, issues kind of fixed with the game. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say fixed because they weren't broken in the first place, but it, it, it's a real labour of love. So it's come from a team of 20 people led by a, a manager named Xander Hadge. I'm sorry if I got that wrong. But apparently they've gone through 80,000 lines of code to reverse engineer this, which just sounds insane to me. One point about uh, kind of emulation versus reverse engineering it is when you're doing emulation, you're like emulating the whole machine. And sometimes mm. that involves having stuff like, you know, I know with the PlayStation ones, you have copyright BIOS and stuff like that, or, you know, chips in the system that it's emulating are actually copyrighted as well. Um, so I think maybe that's the way around it. But uh, yeah, you're still using kind of copies of the assets as well. So uh, yeah. Well, the same with this, you actually need the original ROM to play it. Okay, so, so, I don't, so, yeah. so it rips the assets from there or it, or it yeah. kind of somehow connects it to that, yeah. Yes, I mean, they're reverse engineered and, you know, that 80,000 lines of code, like Ravi said. So I imagine that's all kind of their own work and they've actually uploaded that onto GitHub and they need, they need a copy of the SNES ROM. Um, of the original game for it to play, so it's it's taking the SNES part out of there, but it's yeah. keeping the um, game part of it, the game ROM. Well, yeah. a lot of people have been like, "Oh, they, you know, then it's uh, Nintendo can't do them for copyright." Then I wouldn't put that past Nintendo. Yeah, no, I've got um, a feeling they have to uh, the GTA one got that. taken down by Take Two, and that was you know totally had no original assets in it. Yeah, so uh, yeah, no one's going to go up against uh, Nintendo's lawyers, I'd imagine, but um, it does look a very nice version to run on the PC. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you want to get hold of this, I would get it while you can, that's all I'm saying. Um, it is on GitHub right now, and I'll put that in our show notes as well. Now, we're going to talk about um, something really cool, a new retro Ghostbusters-inspired game, and an update to uh, one of the best sporting games of all time in just a moment. Before we do that, uh, very nice to see all of the lovely comments that we had last week on um, you know, socials, on YouTube, on Discord as well. So many people loved hearing Ash on the podcast last week, didn't they? Yeah, and uh, it's going to be great to get some other patrons on there. But also, you know, we were doing our patron chat, and uh, 
we do a, a great meetup where we do, you know, a video hangout. And I think that was the busiest one we've ever done this week. I think we had 41 people wow. at peak. Yeah, on a, on one single like Google Meets call, which was, uh, yeah, just brilliant. And yeah, we had a bunch of new members on there as well that were giving us room tours. So I think there was quite a few new people came on. Um, to the patrons well, we need for the to start first calling well. it a conference rather than a hangout with that many people <laughs> just sounds more informal hanging out with the guys <laughs> so um this is something that we do for our patrons on the uh, last sunday of every month and being that february i think is uh, you know, the short shortest month of the year um it's only about three weeks away so uh if you'd like to join us for that i mean really it's just an excuse to crack open a drink chat about what you've been up to show off your pickups um, I think, yeah, Matthew was on there. He did his little tour of the, the Sam Coupe. Oh, yeah. Which um, a lot of people haven't seen in person I, before. I was so getting advice on uh, burning a CD ROM as well. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Until, like, you do a Q list, yeah. <laughs> what I love, though, is because, yeah, Ravi was trying to burn a CD ROM and there was a, a corrupted Q file or something on there. But one of the members of our uh, our patrons hangout um, actually fixed that for you in real time. Yeah, and we were sending them back did, and forth and stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's good. So it's just brilliant like that. It's a fantastic community and, um, like we said, growing all the time. So if you'd like to join us for this month's Patrons Hangout, that is coming up at the end of the month. And also this weekend, we did the unthinkable. We managed to get Joe on an Amiga. Yeah, man. Yeah, if you uh, if you do sign up to our second stage Patreon, uh, you will get episode 31 of the Retro Hour After Hours, where we kind of spoke through your guys' Amiga memories, a couple of my Amiga memories as well. I unlocked a few memories playing the A500 Mini, uh, which I did really enjoy. You guys gave some really, really, really cool recommendations on games and Dan went through his list of games that he still plays to this day. Um, And, you know, I kind of gave my thoughts on the A500 Mini and a couple of games uh, that I managed to play in this last week. And like I say, if you sign up, you will get all 30, access to all 31 episodes straight away. Yeah, so definitely worth doing. And uh, the normal podcast, we try and get it out a bit early most weeks for our patrons. If we can, we chop all the adverts out. You get around 10 or 15 minutes of bonus patrons-only material every week in the podcast. So now is a very good time to sign up. And uh, let's induct our latest patrons into the Hall of Fame. And I'll let you guys do this. Hall of Fame. <laughs> so who we got this week? Brian Arsnott and Sean Hayne who both joined us on Patreon over the last week. Thank you so much for your support. That is hugely appreciated. And if you'd like to join our incredible patrons community, all the details to sign up right now are on our website at theretrohour.com. Now, you spied this next one, Joe, and this is right up my street. Now, this is a free game that is kind of a retro Ghostbusters game, just without the title. <laughs> kind of, sort of, is, isn't Ghostbusters, isn't it? Yep. Um, so yeah, this is a brand new game made for the Amstrad. Um, so I believe it does actually run on the Amstrad, you know, if you like do it on an Amstrad EverDrive or whatever, but you know, you can emulate it, obviously. So it's not Ghostbusters, it's Shadow Hunter. Get it right, Dan. Get it right. Even though there's a guy with a backpack and what looks like a proton pack, and he looks there's a slime looks a kind bit like of slime in yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, copyright lawyers, yeah. it is not Ghostbusters. It's not Ghostbusters, but yeah, we have a, a Slimer type character on the main screen. The main guy is called Jack Slimer, who you play as. Like you say, it is free to play on the Amstrad emulator, and you are a ghost pest controller. So you're not a Ghostbuster, you're a Ghost Pest Controller, and you're going for a sweep factory, clearing up the ghosts um, using a pack on your back, which definitely isn't a proton pack. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it looks it it looks right up my alley, right up your alley as well, Dan, doesn't it? Yeah, great little like, kind of side-scrolling platformer. Um, the character looks a bit like Peter Venkman from Real Ghostbusters. Yeah, <laughs> he's, yeah he's got his brown overalls on, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah, and it's great to see this game on the Amstrad as well, because um, you know when I was a kid, my friend Graham, he had an Amstrad CPC, uh, 464, mm. and he had the green screen monitor on it, so it wasn't colour. But we used to play uh, the Activision Ghostbusters game on there. Yeah. Quite a lot, because I mean, I was a, I was a Ghostbusters nut back then. I mean, I had all the toys, watched the cartoon religiously, bought the Marvel comic, you know, every week when that was out. Had all of them at one point. So, you know, the, the fact that I could play Ghostbusters at my friend's house, I was over there playing it quite a lot, because I had a Commodore Plus 4 at home, which never got, you know, a Ghostbusters release on there. Uh, but the only thing about the Activision one, I know it has its fans, and I know we've had um, David Crane on the podcast before talking about the game and kind of the development pressures of making the Ghostbusters video game. I was never the biggest fan of it because in that, I don't know if you guys have played it, you spend more time kind of driving around than you do Ghostbusting. 
I, I've not played any of them to be honest, but obviously, you know, mm. a lot of them were famously covered by like AVGN and stuff like that. And yeah, the only one I've ever played is the Mega Drive one, which is renowned for being the good one, you know, of the yeah. classics. And it does seem to be the case. A lot of these kind of pest control, <laughs> ghost pest controlling games that kind of come out and kind of like, you know, reimaginings of these retro games, uh, they are very much better. <laughs> then you know then what we kind of got back in the 80s and the early 90s other than the Mega Drive one you know and I think it's a lot of fans of Ghostbusters who are kind of like trying to be like this is what we should have got or this is what we could have had yeah and I think it's also free from the development pressures yeah. of you know uh, Activision saying right we need this game make it in five weeks or something yeah, like that yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. they spent a bit more yeah. time on it and they've learnt the hardware by now inside out as well I wonder how successful Ghostbusters would have been if they called it Ghost Pest Controllers. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah, what, what was actually another name for Ghostbusters? I can't remember. Ghost Blasters, it was going was to be called Ghost originally. Blasters, was it? Yeah. Oh, man. That was the original title. <laughs> yeah, so I think they made the right choice there. But um, if you want a good um, old school Ghostbusters style game for your Amstrad CPC or your emulator, uh, that is available to download now for free. So I'll uh, link that up in our show notes as well. And you know what you are, Ravi? What? A Ghost Blaster. You're a ghost, Oh yeah! Of course, we're talking uh, Sensi Soccer. You're a big fan, Ravi. Oh, a huge fan, actually. I've been playing it all month, and uh, I've been waiting for one thing because uh, my football team, U Reds Forest, are finally in the Premier League. So uh, you know we're going to stay up and. This is a, a kind of update for Sensible Soccer, which means all the latest teams are in there. The latest clubs from the 2022 and 23 season as well. And the cool thing about this is, you know, you can have it on your original Amiga. And they do this quite a bit. I mean, that's the thing. Sensible World of Soccer we're talking about, which was um, the last version of that game that came out on the Amiga. Um, back in, what was it, like 93, 94? Did that come out originally? Around then. And basically what it is, yeah, it, it's a pack that you can plug into your original game and it updates all the players and uh, gives you the season data for 22 and 23. Now, I've got to admit, you know, I'm, I'm not a big football fan. Uh, neither is Joe. I don't think we make any secret about Even that. Even though you work for a football podcast and Joe I works actually for produce a football <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, Sensi was always like the one football game that I could actually play because you know, I'm terrible at you know FIFA and that but I did always find Sensible Soccer fun to play and I think it's definitely a game that in terms of retro football games has uh, probably lasted better than any other hasn't it because I mean there are still tournaments around the world yeah yeah they and, and like you know I've been using this thing called the Total Swaz Pack and I'm sure mm. the Total Swaz Pack is also going to get this update in there and you can run this on your PC you can run it on Morphos as well and um, what it is, is it's a, it's a kind of menu that has all of the different versions of Swaz. So you can pick teams from like, you know, the 90s, but obviously you'll be able to pick the team from recent teams like today and have all the players updated. You'd also be able to choose the pitch type. You're able to choose the sound effects, um, the sound of the crowd, you know, the fan noise, even what's on the advertising boards. It's like got... Complete customization, but it's... You know what you need to do, Ravi? Get some retro hour banners to go around the board. Oh, God, yeah, that would be good. Hack it some way. <laughs> yeah, but also it's got those games in there which were those kind of crossovers, which I know you love, Dan, which was like uh, there was one Sensible Soccer on the Moon. There was a mm. Cannon Soccer, which was a, oh. a crazy mix between Cannon Fodder and Sensible Soccer. Love that. Yeah, that was that was uh, on the, I think it was Christmas 93, covered this for Amiga Format. Yeah, and I just played that non-stop. I tried to play it again recently, actually. It was so difficult. Yeah, it's it's hard. And, you know, the guys that are involved in this uh, are, are really cool. Like, um, we've got uh, Amiga Live, which is, uh, if you haven't checked it out, that's uh, a way to play Amiga games online with your friends as well. So I'm sure this version is going to be on Amiga Live, which is, uh, you know, AmigaLive.com. And um, we've also got Player Aveli, and he, he seems to be you know, doing a lot of this stuff behind Sensible Soccer and, and keeping it all alive as well, which is absolutely awesome. So if you check out sensiblesoccer.de, you can get the latest updates. Yeah, and you can. there's a WHD load version of it as well. There's so you tons. Can... There's an online league. There's like competitions going on, uh, you know, rankings, tournaments. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. And, uh, you know, it's it's... It's really good because they've got it for all systems. So, um, 
here you've got a PC version, Amiga version, Xbox, uh, Windows, and then you've also got a Sega uh, online competition as well. So <laughs> pretty well, interesting to see. Let's imagine Ravi there this weekend in his uh, his forest shirt oh, playing oh, Swass. Totally. In. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With our too many new players. It's going to be good. So that is available now if you want to get it, and it is free, of course. So uh, if you want to get your, your Sensi on, um, I'll link that up. And everything else we talk about in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, before we chat to this week's special guest, Jason Kingsley is coming up in just a moment. Uh, just a quick mention for um, this brand new computer museum that's opened. And I think this is one of the coolest websites I've ever seen. Yeah, this is a, a, an insanely cool website. Uh, this is the Northwest Computer Museum as well. Uh, they recently had like a feature on them on the uh, BBC and they're doing like a soft launch. And this is in Lee and it does look really awesome. It's open at Wednesday till Sunday, 10 till 4 as well. And, uh, you know, it looks like really good fun. <laughs> Okay, next, an incredible guest to bring you on the podcast this week. We're going to be joined by Rebellion co-founder and CEO, Jason Kingsley, next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guest. And what a treat we've got for you this week. We're chatting to someone who's behind one of Britain's longest running software companies who just celebrated their 30th anniversary in the industry. And let's talk to co-founder and CEO of Rebellion Developments, if you still use that full title, Jason Kingsley, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Yeah, we just go by the name Rebellion these days. We, we sort of dropped the developments part of it a long, long time ago, and uh, it seems to sort of follow us around. We're just sort of just trying to use the Rebellion name. <laughs> right, <laughs> fair enough. Well, 30 years in the industry, I mean, that is some achievement, and obviously we'll get into uh, some of the work that you've done over the last three decades in the industry, but to kind of, you know, take it right back to day one, what was your first kind of experience of video games and where did your journey Ooh, begin? Oh, well, that in involved um, being at school and there was a, uh, I think a big business uh, donated um, donated a computer that filled a whole room and the display was a, was, was literally tape. Uh, there was a printout uh, and there was a tape thing. I don't know whether anybody actually remembers punch tape, but... I, I used to muck about coding uh, badly. I hasten to add, I'm not a coder. I used to try, but I never really had the uh, appetite for it. But I was interested in the technology. But um, you used to be able to take a program out with you on a rolled up piece of paper with a piece of sellotape in your pocket, and you'd come back in and then run that through the the reader, which would literally be looking at data for you know uh, dots and dashes, effectively of light. Uh, and that would be the that would be the coding. Yeah, it was it was um it was a really good in uh, introduction to what computers are. And I imagine that computer is probably significantly less powerful than anybody's worst ever mobile phone. And uh, I was wondering then, what was your first like home system or, or computer that you got at home and started? First, on? yeah, that, yeah. Well, first system was one that Chris, my brother and co-founder of the company, built called an Educit, uh, and I think it had a hex. It had two hex displays, so it, uh, and I think it had uh, eight bytes of memory. Uh, so you know, it was pretty impressive at the time. Uh, it wasn't actually. It was fairly low rent even then. But even so, it was something you had to solder together. So Chris built his first home computer from a kit and solder, literally. And then the first sort of commercial system we had was a Commodore PET uh, with its sort of uh, green screen. And uh, we both used to code that. I used to code uh, a sort of space flying game uh, there, then we transitioned onto Ataris and and various other bits and bobs. But yes, that that Commodore PET was it was a keyboard. It was a proper sort of working computer. And if you wanted to, there were games available, but if you they were very primitive, and you had to work out which ASCII character represented your character. Yeah, so, there were no um, sprites, were there? It was just no sprites kind at of all. ASCII characters. Yeah. Oh, so the so the asterisk symbol appeared in quite a lot of places, and you could do a nice animation by doing asterisk. A co semicolons, colons, and flickering them, and it would sort of look a little bit like an animated explosion. And if you wanted monsters, the pie symbol was always quite good because it vaguely looked a bit like a 
sheep or a dog or a goat or something like that. <laughs> and that could sort of move across the screen. Uh, but, but step by step, you couldn't sort of tell it to move anything other than a whole character. Uh, and I remember coding using peaks and pokes of memory. So, uh, yeah, it was very creative because you, you, you had very little to work with and you had to use your imagination quite a lot. Well, I mean, away from the screen, I mean, were you, were you into anything like, you know, Dungeons and Dragons? Were you playing games like that? I was. I had, um, in fact, there was tons and trolls I had. So I discovered um, wargaming, as it was really, um, and Dungeons and Dragons was based on a war game. So it's tabletop wargaming. So I used to enjoy board games and wargaming. And I imported a copy of Tunnels and Trolls into the into the UK, which is good. Dungeons and Dragons wasn't actually available here, so Tunnels and Trolls was amongst the first role, proper tabletop role playing games um, in in the UK. And I managed to find a team of um, uh, well fellow members of school that would have a go at playing that game with me. So so that was sort of interesting. So I've always been interested in fantasy and traveling and creating landscapes for other people to explore. Because I think that's really at the heart of being a games, computer games maker. You're actually creating this place for other people to have fun in. And uh, another place as well that you can kind of use your imagination, uh, you know, when, you, when you're playing one of those titles. Um, I, w- I was wondering, did you have a lot of like interest in British comics and the kind of comic book culture that was coming out there? Absolutely, yeah. Very much not particularly into the American style comics. They, those were sort of sold on spinners in my local news agents, and and they they, they always had a. I always felt ripped off by them because you see a picture of, uh, you know, the mighty Thor, and you think, oh, that sounds good, but the the program, the, the the comic inside never bore any resemblance to the cover at all, as far as I could tell. So I always felt a bit ripped off, and they were never. They were never available in sequence. I presume they were shipped in in a container and then just distributed to news agents sort of willy nilly. So you were lucky if you got one or two in a, in order. The 2000 AD, a lot of comics were there. 2000 AD was one of them. And and I remember buying the first copy of 2000 AD, issue number one with the space spinner from the local news agents um, just after buying a bag of uh, fish and chips on my way home from school. So um, and I've had a lifelong love for all kinds of creative media, but obviously 2000 AD has got a soft spot, a definite soft spot for that. And that would have been after like um, Eagle Comics and Dan Dare and stuff like that. Were you all, yeah, all, that, also into those? Yeah, no, that that era sort of missed me. I don't think I was quite old enough for that. I know my dad was really into Dan Dare, um, but I don't remember seeing any of those comics unless sort of in passing in sort of in, in general ways. But no, for some reason I missed out on that. I, I probably did encounter the kids' comics. I remember the Bash Street Kids. And I remember um, the sort of funny comics uh, that were a bit gruesome. I can't remember what they were called, but things like um, uh, not Shiver and Shake. It might have been Shiver and Shake. I can't remember. But they, they all had funny names, and they used to merge with each other, and then it would be sort of this comic combined with that. Uh, and it sort of had grotesque characters in the, in the style of the sort of Beano and Bash Street Kids, but, you know, their own. And, of course, those have all merged together, and we now own them because we, we, we own the vast bulk of British comics publishing now uh, at Rebellion. We managed to kind of buy both of those archives, which is really good. And we've got a whole bunch. We've got a line of um, reissued graphic novels called The Treasury of British Comics, which we are re- slowly going through reprin- reprinting a lot of the classics. In fact, I think there's a, a series about British romance comics coming out because – a lot of people don't realize that, that comics were an enormous medium and there were so many, you know, there were obviously war comics and action comics and adventure comics and superhero comics, but there were also comics about pony riding and the comics about ballerinas and comics about racing cars. And, you know, it was very broad as a medium. Uh, and it, of course it's narrowed down mostly to things like 2000 AD and the you know, superheroes, but superheroes were a tiny, tiny fraction of the comics market for an awfully long time, although they're massive now, of course. Well, I've read that you um, studied zoology at university. So um, what was kind of the story there then? How did you go from like studying animals to getting into game design? So that's quite a, quite a curve there. Well, well I, did, I did both, basically. I've always been interested in writing. I, I wrote an adventure game book um, between school and university, which is a number one hit called Steel Eye and the Lost Magic. I wrote a lot of He-Man tie-ins uh, for Ladybird books. I think I wrote four of those for them. Um, so that was kind of good in the gap between, you know, between sixth form college and then going up to Oxford 
and um, made a bit of money as well, actually. It was rather nice in those days. It was a few hundred quid, but that went a long way when you were a, when you were a student back then. Yeah. Um, so I've always been interested in the two, but obviously I followed an academic path. My dad was a doctor, mum, mum's teacher, and, and so it was obvious that I would go through the sort of standard educational stuff and, and did quite well and studied zoology, loved animals, loved animal behaviour, always had horses in my life from the age of eight. I used to train and look after horses. I still do. Uh, you probably, I don't know whether you do know, but I've got an awful lot of my own horses. Um, like 15 or something I read, is it? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, depends how you count the numbers. So I've got two ponies, so whether they count as horses or not. Uh, uh, but yeah, individual creatures, yes. Um, yeah. And I train them. So I do a lot of the high school stuff. It's, it's sort of my professional hobby, if you like. I really love doing it, but I also do it professionally. And I do a lot of movies and TV shows and documentaries and things like that in armor with swords. So, so just to get back to the, the, where the zoology thing comes from, I've always felt science is quite a good basis for business because you look at data and businesses, business is about analyze, should be about analyzing data and working out what the best route through that data is. And I think that a science degree is lays the foundation for proper analysis of data, uh, different to arts degrees, which are equally valid, but valid in a different way. You know, arts degrees are about having opinions, about constructing an argument, which is all very useful, but they lack the the idea of what is right and wrong in, in, in a way. And in business, you obviously need both. You need a balance of opinion and creativity. But you also need to look at the data. So if a, you know, if uh, if the audience doesn't like a thing you're doing, well, you better change. Otherwise, you go out of business quickly. Well, you know, talking about entering the industry, I know there was like early games like um, Better Dead Than Alien, uh, Murder and Blade <laughs> Warrior. So you know, this kind of entrance into the the industry professionally. Mm. When did you decide to make it a full time career? Then, well, I sort of it's weird isn't it I, I fell into it i sort of enjoyed writing games i enjoyed designing them doing the artwork so i was a designer and an artist uh i, I realized that my coding was never really going to be up to speed um but i my art was and my design work and my you know ability to organize was as well so that was an area that i wanted to sort of build on there's a funny story about murder actually which was a is a cluedo game uh we did it on multiple formats and um we came back from, it was US Gold, and we were coming back from where US Gold were based, driving down the motorway. And uh, Grant and I, wasn't my brother at the time, but it was Grant, uh, and I stopped in a, in a um, what do they call them, a motorway service station to have a fry up because we'd celebrated because we just signed the deal. So we got the deal. And we were talking about getting the contract to do murder quite openly, of course, for us. We <laughs> were talking about the computer game. I couldn't quite work out why, why, why the cafe around us, which is a bit of a trucker's cafe, was sort of slightly, you know, clearing. Well, these guys were sort of leaving quite abruptly. And it, it was only afterwards when I realized that there's a whole bunch of truckers out there that probably were sitting there thinking, God, these two guys are openly talking about getting a contract to murder somebody. We should just get out of here. <laughs> yeah. um, That's one, one way to clear out a little chef. Exactly. It's very funny. It was literally, it was literally days afterwards, right? Do you remember we, the, the place got really empty really quickly uh, and it suddenly dawned on us that it could be misinterpreted. So there's possibly some old truckers out there who have told people this story in the pub that honestly they were sitting there somewhere in a super, in, in a motorway service station, <laughs> these two young assassins openly talking about killing somebody uh, and, and nobody believes them. In fact, it was us talking about the computer game murder. I always find that funny. That's brilliant. Well, there, there, there was a good um, selection of like video game companies, and a lot of them came out of the kind of Britsoft era and like you know the the kind of cot cottage industry. Were there many that you like looked up to or admired? Uh, to be honest, I'm always impressed that anybody runs a business successfully. You know, it doesn't matter how big or small. It, it, it's a it's a heck of a thing to start a business and run it. So, you know, people often ask me, you know, who are your heroes and who do you look up to? And the answer is, I I'm I'm impressed with everybody that is capable of getting off their ass and actually doing something, you know, doing a podcast takes a lot of energy and effort, you know, just you know, starting a business, getting a job. These things all take a lot of energy. And and I'm always impressed with that. There's, there's no one individual that I've never really looked up to individuals. I'm impressed with things that some people have done in some ways, but, you know, I, I've, I've never really followed the sort of hero 
kind of hero, not worship, but, you know, the hero of being impressed by this particular person. Because at the end of the day, I know everybody's got flaws. We've got strengths and weaknesses. And it's just hopefully our strengths outweigh our weaknesses, most of us. Well, let's go back 30 years then. Because, I mean, Rebellion did celebrate, you know, your 30th birthday last month yeah. in December of um, 2022. So going back to, to late 1992, when you and your brother formed the company, why did you decide to take the jump and form your own company? It's almost a sort of naive ignorance in a way. We just thought, hey, let's let's have a go. Let's do this. Let's set up a limited company. I think with a with a limited company structure, for those that don't know, it gives you a bit more of a of a thing to present to people. You know, if you're just two guys doing stuff, it sounds a bit less formal. But if you've got a limited company, you've got rules you've got to follow, you've got to do accounts. Um, it, it, it sounds a bit more professional, I think, or did to us at the time. So, and we thought we thought that's the that was the way to go. Uh, and yeah, so we just we just sort of flung ourselves into it. We we know we knew we wanted to have a go at making computer games. And I, I think I think I said to my mum, "We're going to have a go at this. And if it hasn't worked out after three years, um, I'll go and train to be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that, get a proper job, as she used to call it." Um, and luckily, we never did get a proper job. And here we are, 30 years later. <laughs> well, uh, your first game was Eye of the Storm. And uh, that was praised for its 3D engine at the time. And uh, I remember it was DOS and Amiga as well. Um, w- what was the story behind that game? Well, yes. I mean, back in those days, we were we were cutting edge of the 3D technology. We had, we had uh, Guru shading um, technology in that game. We had curves in there. You know, these are all incredibly cutting edge graphical techniques done by the, the, the couple of guys that were, were, were working with me in the coding. It was, it was really impressive. And it was sort of the thing to do was to sort of push the technology. Yeah, the, it, was, it was a bit more of a cottage industry, I suppose. And there wasn't really a focus on market analysis or working out who your audience would be. It was almost as if everybody that played computer games would play your game because it was a new computer game. There weren't that many competitive things out there. And as long as you could get a bit of coverage in some magazines, you know, you would have a reasonable success. And of course, budgets were minuscule, you know, budgets are tens of thousands of pounds as opposed to tens of millions or hundreds of millions of pounds as they are now. So you could sort of afford to try something and fail. I mean, six, six months to a year was, was quite a, for three people was quite a decent chunk of time and money to put a game together um, and people were more were not necessarily more forgiving it was just expectations were lower when you did something like that and you had a 3d landscape you were traveling through and for those who don't know either storm was set in the great eye of jupiter you were exploring it you were photographing uh, animals as you flew through the landscape and there were robots that attached you and you could be sent on missions and you explored this three-dimensional space it was incredibly innovative, uh, and a lot of the games we did were innovating both graphics and technology. But we were amongst the first people to do a proper 3D game or 2.5D game. So, you know, we were, and still are, right at the forefront of technology, although a lot of people these days use other people's engines. We still code everything with our own tech. It's just sort of part of our DNA, what we do at Rebellion. Well, around that time, I mean, it was quite difficult to know which systems were going to be successful and which ones to back. I mean, obviously, either Storm came out on the Amiga, that was a very big platform at the time, and then slowly faded away over the next few years. You had MS DOS as well, but you're actually one of the um, early developers for the Atari Jaguar. So, how did you get involved with Atari? What was kind of the story there? <laughs> this is quite a funny story. We were amongst the first people in the UK to even know of the existence of the Atari Jaguar, and I include the people that worked at Atari in the UK at the time. So, we'd, we'd coded a, a demo, 3D demo, which involved dragons and Viking longships. We used to fly the dragon, and you had Viking longships, and it was sort of, yeah. It, 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 that's what it was really it was just a demo of those two things and we took it into atari and slough and atari in those days were sort of they were sort of on their knees a little bit they'd once been a huge company they were still sort of big ish but their building was obviously designed for a thousand people and probably had about 50 people in it so there were lots of rooms you walked through with nobody in it and also i remember that there was um brown hessian wallpaper on the reception area yeah the very very sort of 70s but it was so, you know, the edges had scuffed and was fraying. So it, it was a brilliant snapshot of of the, the fashion of the time. I mean, some people might remember the 70s were all about brown things. 
brown and yeah. orange everywhere, um, big floral patterns and that kind of thing. So we went through and we, we spoke to, was it Bob Gledo? I can't remember, Jack Tramiel. Anyway, wh- one of the very high ups in uh, in the UK, I'm blanking on the, the who exactly it was, uh, with Alistair Bowden in tow as well. And Al- Alistair had seen our demo and wanted to show it to the boss. He thought it was really good. Um, so we went to see the boss and the boss went, oh, yeah, this is actually really, really good. We should maybe uh, get these guys to do something on the, uh, the, the new console we're doing. And Alistair Bowden said, what new console? And the boss said, oh, yeah, I was going to tell you next week. Yeah, we've got this new piece of hardware coming up called the Jaguar. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about it all next week in lots of meetings. And and then there was this sort of big argument about how that would be. Anyway, so Chris and I sort of sat there in the background listening to these two um, people having a bit of a discussion about what the Atari Jaguar was. So, so yeah, we were there at the unofficial unveiling to a third party <laughs> of the Atari Jaguar in the U.K., but yeah, as a result of that, we went down to Cambridge where it was being made, worked with the guys from Flare Design, I think it was, and got one of their uh, what their test hand built test systems, and and started working with it. It was in an old sort of beige tin box, the sort that old com- you know old desktop computers used to come in. Uh, I think it was called the Alpine at the time. The code word for the board was the Alpine board, if I remember rightly. And obviously, it went through a lot of iterations. The hardware was was literally custom built, and um, we we worked well with the Flare guys to actually build the, the the platform. And and we were there right at the very beginning. Yeah, and I remember seeing the first controllers when they came through the test ones and uh, how chunky they were. But I thought the innovation of the keyboard on the controller was kind of interesting, with a with a replaceable kind of overlays, plastic overlays for it, which was a good idea. Yeah, it kind of meant you had to look away from the screen sometimes, didn't it? But it mm. did give you a lot of extra buttons, which I guess, you know, for people that were porting PC games and that too, it probably made it a bit easier. Yeah, um, yeah. It was but, certainly interesting. What was great, it was innovative, but that controller mm. was really quite big. And of course, if you had smaller hands, it was quite felt a bit too chunky. I, I've, I've, I don't mind the controller, actually. I've always got on quite mm. well with it. Um, and I think, you know, in particular, we, we talk about, you know, Alien versus Predator, which I think plays really well on that controller. And it is, it's obviously considered one of the standout games on the Atari Jaguar. There are not many of them, but, you know, generally if people pick like five games that it's worth trying a Jaguar out for, Alien versus Predator is always at number one. Mm. So what was kind of the, the development process like? And were there many challenges along the way when you're making that game? Huge number of challenges, yes, because that's a sort of two and a half D game. If you remember, you can't really look up and down. You can only sort of scroll left and right. And of course, we were working with new hardware in the sort of old ways of new hardware. You know, the idea of backwards compatibility with anything was irrelevant. You know, you and the tools weren't properly developed, and the systems were constantly being flushed and redone. And yeah, so it was sort of two steps forward, one step backwards, quite regularly. Uh, and it was sort of how powerful is this machine? And the answer is nobody knows yet because nobody's really pushed it. So how do we push it? So it was one of the first games with um, proper 16-bit graphics, color graphics, full color graphics. And we actually made, this is kind of interesting, well before you had scanners and uh, decent scanners or photogrammetry, which we do all the time for our new games. We we go out there with photogrammetry and, you know, it's it's all super high res. Back in those days, we actually get this. We actually built panels, nine centimeter by nine centimeter panels on cardboard. I built them using plasticine, spray paint, all that kind of stuff, glue. Um, photographed them with a traditional camera, i.e. a film camera. Uh, developed the roll down at Boots. Uh, had it printed out, brought the printouts back, scanned them in on our flatbed scanner and then cut them out and post-process them a little bit to put them into the game. So it was wow. photogrammetry, but a very crude form of it. Kind of like it's a collage style. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah literally. Keep- it gave it a really good look because it looked real, because it really was real. I've, I've still got the panels somewhere in a box, in a shoe box. But yeah, we literally built, we literally physically built models for the graphics. The Alien was a was a model, uh, yeah, an Airfix kind of kit model, which we animated with, yeah, we literally animated that and took photographs of it from north, south, east and west and it doing its sort of animations and, and used that as well, cut that out laboriously. So it was very manual, but we were using photographic quality graphics at the time before really that was a thing you could do with the techniques and, and hardware. 
so yeah very proud of that very innovative and of course the idea of playing the baddies in a game was was completely innovative as well nobody ever allowed you to play the game from the perspective of one or more baddies so that was that was me and my brother's innovation uh atari wanted us to do a side scoring beat em up on the atari jaguar and we persuaded them somehow that no we could do this sort of two and a half d it was it was before we'd seen doom um so right. we didn't know doom was coming at the time they beat us to the market but we we didn't know doom was uh was coming at that time then we saw it and obviously they beat us to the market with the, with the tech and did superbly well so well done guys but um but for us it was pure innovation yeah um th- th- they also said that uh there was a lynx port that was uh announced and in development of uh alien vs predator but um it ended up getting cancelled like how far did you guys get with that i don't even really remember that i know atari were having all sorts of problems financially um at the time we were having difficulty getting payments out of them on time and you know which for a small company with about seven people was always a difficult thing you know trying to get the money before we had to pay everybody it was difficult and for quite a few months chris and i didn't pay ourselves just to keep things going so i think it may have been something they talked about maybe we did some early work on it but i think it probably fizzled out because we did another game we were doing we did legions of the dead for them which never got anywhere um which is sort of a variation on avp and we did Skyhammer, which eventually came out through Songbird many, many years later on a, on a, a kind of exclusive cartridge. Um, again, that was proper 3D then because we'd, we'd, we'd nailed how it would work. But again, we used the same techniques of 3D, of scanning rather, 2D photographs of real things. So, yeah, it was, it was interesting. It was interesting working with Atari at the time. It was um, – we didn't know it, but they were a company sort of on their way in decline, put it that way. Well, you also created a um, checkered flag for the Jaguar as well, which um, seems quite inspired by Virtua Racing. I mean, what was that like to make on, on the Jaguar's hardware? That was very difficult. It basically, it was heavily inspired by Virtua Racing. It, it, it was, it, look, we could do this sort of smooth, shaded 3D game. Could you make us a racing game like that? And we, of course, said yes. We didn't really know whether we could, but we, we said yes because we needed, the, you know, we wanted the, the, the project. Uh, and, um, yeah, we managed to get that sorted out, but we had, um, had all sorts of interesting situations with the Atari personnel as well. Cause they, they, they had a variety of different, um, skill levels. So I think there were some people working for Atari that were very experienced and others that were less experienced. And it was always, it's always a challenge working with somebody that doesn't really understand, uh, these things, not with Atari, but I remember once, um, being over at Mirasoft before we founded Rebellion, working for Mirasoft uh, on a game and being told the game that was being done on the Spectrum, this particular senior member of staff whose name I won't say here, uh, I'll maybe save it for my memoirs one day, said, I don't give me any shit about the hardware limitations. I want it to be 32-bit graphics because that's the mm. cutting edge at the moment. And we all sat there and went, it, the hardware doesn't do that it, then don't give me any of that defeatist shit was said to us so we all sort of shrugged and looked at each other it's like uh, okay yep and then yeah i'll just wave my magic wand yeah exactly <laughs> exactly did have another they've had another one which is kind of sweet as well we worked with somebody who had very very poor eyesight to the point that he was actually i think registered blind as a producer which is very unusual very brave to be a computer games producer back in those days if you can't see what's on the screen but anyway, he um, he wanted the red to be redder. And we said, but it's already 255R and naught, naught. So it doesn't get any redder. Uh, and he said, well, just just try and fix it for me. So I had a brainstorm. So I just turned the uh, color up on the monitor, um, <laughs> made it brighter. And he was very happy. I said, yeah, we've hacked the hardware. Um, <laughs> and what we've done is turn the brightness up. And he was very happy with that. So that was good. That was a nice, that was a fairly easy bug to solve. Well, I mean, moving forward a couple of years to uh, 1999, that's when you released um, Aliens versus Predator for the PC. Yes. So did the Jaguar game like lead to you being able to do that game as well? Yeah, very much it did. Yes, absolutely. So Fox, 20th Century Fox set up their um, Fox Interactive and they approached us and said, would you like to, we, we are the license holders. Uh, would you like to sort of revisit aliens versus you know the the game you did aliens versus predator for us so we jumped to the chance and this was proper 3d um at, back in the day fast game 
um, again, playing the alien predator marine, being able to run on the ceilings and walls, that that was really innovative. And if you look at the subsequent aliens versus predator done by other people, they never really managed to repeat that. Uh, I think Monolith took the gig on from us afterwards and didn't, and they failed to really cope and do the uh, running on walls and ceilings from a first person perspective. Very, very technically difficult. So, uh, so yeah, that was, that was really interesting. Working with Fox was great because we got access to the sound library of the original movies. We actually got to look around. They do a sequel to it or something. I can't remember. We were in, we were visiting Fox and they showed us some of the stuff that they were doing for another film set in the same world. It might have been, might have been the next. Yes, it was the, the next Aliens versus Predator. Uh, movie mm. the the one set on a prison planet you know, a wooden planet or something that was really weird with monks uh, i don't know it was very it was a bit of a misstep as a movie but um i remember we were on that film set uh, that was kind of fun to, to to see but yeah that was that was great working directly with fox uh on the license and um having fun making a scary game one of the biggest innovations in that game was me saying to the team i want to kill the player while they're listening to the briefing at the beginning because nobody ever done that before because people are, you know, the briefing you're out of the game and then you start the game and it's like, Oh, okay. Now we're, we're and I wanted to kill the player straight away because the briefing was only very short and, you know, kill somebody at the beginning of the game. It's fine. They can get going again, but it absolutely terrified people because they weren't expecting it. It was absolutely brilliant, brilliant to watch the reactions. So, so yeah, that was, uh, that was very pleasing. Well, one of my favorite titles was a uh, judge dread versus death. And, uh, yeah, that was such a groundbreaking title. And I kind of wonder why, you know, there, there, there were like Judge Dredd games before that, but I wonder why there wasn't the focus on the movie kind of Judge Dredd and it went with this storyline of uh, Judge Dredd versus yeah, Judge well that, Death. Yeah, that was, um, that was very much unconnected with the movie because the movie was a, was a separate thing. It was quite a story behind the, 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 the movie and various uh, legal rights and arguments and people threatening to sue people and all sorts of stuff well well before our time but obviously with a major with a mega movie star like sylvester stallone at the at the helm he and a and a first time director there was going to be a there's going to be tensions on set as a result of the result of that so it was all it was all you know it was different to the way i'd understood dread but that, that that's you know people's opinions differ on that particular game but um dread versus death the game was totally separate not connected at all to the Stallone movie in the slightest. It was just a a version of us making a Judge Dredd game, really trying to lean into this idea of arresting people uh, and sentencing them for, um, for for doing crimes and trying to create an uh, almost an open world landscape. But I don't think we really could do it with the technology. It was too ambitious. So yeah, um, yeah it, it 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 was good, but we really couldn't. We were basically trying to do Grand Theft Auto before Grand Theft Auto. But it also had that comic style with it, which, um, you know, now yes. you see in a lot of games. And uh, that was one of the really early ones to do it, especially in mm. a kind of, um, you know, 3D first person kind of environment. Yes. Yeah, we went for the what we called at the time, we called our graphic novel renderer. So, yes, yeah, so we were going for, for that sort of the computers were beginning to get to the stage where you could you, you weren't just doing any graphics you could you could start to stylize them a bit and make them work differently for you. So that was that was the beginnings of, of, of looking at how you want to style things. And we weren't trying to simulate reality. We were trying to do something a bit more creative and different. Well, you mentioned before that Rebellion acquired 2000 AD. I mean, was it your aim to kind of bring back some of these legendary icons like back into the public eye again? Yeah, that, I mean, really very simple. There were, there, were, there were two reasons. So in the year 2000, so it's nice and easy to remember. Um, I'd approached Egmont, who were the previous owners, to license Stronto Dog for a game. Uh, and they, they sort of didn't really say yes or no, but it was a bit weird. It was just like odd. Anyway, cut a long story short, three years later, we managed to acquire the whole library, the whole catalogue uh, and the ongoing business of 2000 AD because it was actually owned by a Danish company then through for a variety of, of, of reasons to do with uh, all sorts of things. And um, we brought it home and we reinvested in 2000 AD as a, as a comic as well, because the previous owners had appreciated the value of it, but they didn't really want to build on it. And they felt like most magazines that it had reached the end of its life and should slowly be sort of phased out. Well, I didn't agree with them uh, and neither did the team working on 2000 AD. And um, 
together we managed to work out how to sort of bring it back and rescue it and it's now going strong i think very soon rebellion will have owned 2000 ad for half its life which is uh, which is a heck of an achievement for somebody that read and bought the first copy in 1977 as yeah a kid. And, and, and the fact that i can still go into a shop and i can still see you know i think it was judge Dredd magazine yes uh, last time and uh yeah also you know uh, a strontium dog game um mm. He's one of my favourite characters. If people don't know, he's a he's a bounty hunter uh, with some uh, interesting friends. Did that game ever happen? No, it never did. No, they, we couldn't get we, we couldn't get the license initially. Then we bought the whole thing. So you know, people say, "Oh, do you have you licensed Judge Red?" No, no, no. We own it outright. You know, we we own that whole catalogue, and we've added to the catalogue with a Treasure of British Comics and Roy the Rovers and uh, all sorts of other characters. We've got thousands and thousands of comic book characters now, going back to the earliest ever comic called Comic Cuts for Boys, um, which was a, in those days, they were called funny papers for boys. They weren't called comics. But I think there's a possibility that the word comic comes from the success of Comic Cuts for Boys because it was massive. And we think that might be the origin of the use of the word comic uh, throughout the industry, actually, which is really weird. So, yeah, we got the original of that Um 1888 it's a long long time ago oh another another fantastic 2000 ad character was rogue trooper yeah. and uh the rogue trooper game was originally released and uh you, you designed that didn't you yes and, absolutely yeah and, yeah. and, and then I'm, I'm, later you went and did a redux uh could you tell us about the kind of rogue trooper story yeah well rogue trooper is obviously one of my favorite characters and he it's a it's a, a future war story genetic infantryman in a in a, in a war-torn kind of almost sort of like world war one bunkers and giant buildings and that kind of stuff and huge tanks um but in the future so we managed to do the you know the rogue trooper game which was very successful and then we decided some of the team said you know what we could we could redo this now we could we could do a redux we could revisit it on new platforms uh wouldn't be too expensive to do lots of people love it uh and that's what we did yeah we sort of we we we've sort of revisited it as a game and sort of brought it up to up to date with better graphics. So that was kind of pleasing. That was an interesting game because you had the 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 for those that don't know, Rogue is solo, but he has the helmet, the uh, gunner, and the backpack, helm, bagman, and gunner as separate elements that he carries around with him. But he can take them off, and they have their own intelligence. So we had a game where it was kind of one character, but you could split into three. You could put Helm down to hack doors. Gunnar had his own tripod stand, so he could put down as a sentry gun type of thing to guard something. You could stealth around and do something. Um, uh, Bagman had mines and all sorts of and repair systems and that kind of thing, manufacturing systems. You could pick up, you could pick up junk, and he could manufacture ammo uh, in his in, in the bag uh, and give it to you at a certain rate. So, so yeah, very pleased with that game. It was, uh, it, it was good. And we tried to sort of revisit the comic book as well, sort of take, tell the story of the first tales of Rogue Trooper, the Quartz Zone Massacre and that kind of thing. Cause they're, um, uh, they're like personalities as well of his, uh, former uh, comrades, aren't they? Oh, yes. In, yeah. In, so inside that, so within the game, it added that aspect yeah. of having partners with you, even though you've kind of yeah not really oh, got them there. It's, it's a bit weird. Yeah. Yeah. So for the listener, the conceit is that they, they were all genetically engineered and they have these biochips in their brains. And if you if they die, their personality is recorded onto the biochips and you've got sort of 30 seconds to remove the chip, put it on your equipment where it's going to be kept sort of, engin- you know, kept energized. And then it can go back to base and they can grow a new body around the personality uh, and you can go back to war, you know, so you never die, assuming your biochip stays intact. And of course, Rogue Rogue is is an outcast now. So his buddies are stuck in his gun, helmet, and backpack, and they're his they're his squad. So they have their own personalities, and they talk back to him. So it's a fascinating story idea. It's absolutely brilliant. Jerry Finley Day came up with the idea, and it's absolutely brilliant. I I was also wondering, like, what are the considerations needed uh, when you bring in such a, a loved character to video games? For me, what you've got to do is um, you, you've got to deliver what the fans that know the character wants, but you've also got to create something that can go broader to broader audience as well. And I think I think there have recently been some media missteps in that they kind of 
assume the fans will watch any old crap and and ignore the sort of underlying rules of of the story um i don't want to mention any names but you know well i will lord of the rings for example lord of the rings the the, the, the rings of power thing was fairly controversial for what i could see in that it sort of didn't follow the sort of fan rules the, the the way it's supposed to work you know the main characters differed from how they were shown in everything else in the book uh and i always think that's dangerous i think one of the things you've got to do is that you, you, you don't want to make a copy of the book or the tv show or whatever it is but you've got to you've got to be true to the source material within the confines of making a game obviously you know rogue trooper doesn't start out the Bad, baddest badass combat you know, he's got to improve as he goes along which he doesn't do in the in the comic book because he's a super soldier but in the game he's got to improve you've got to give the player something to do there and of course in the game you can die um and of course in the comic book you can't uh so so there are lots of compromises you could do within the game but i think if you throw away you know, for example rogue trooper if we'd made a rogue trooper game we'd ignored the fact that he was blue We'd ignored the fact that he had biochips on his and his gu- and his gu- gunner was called something different, and Bagman was called something different, and Helm was called something different. The fans would have been annoyed, and your broad market doesn't care because they don't know the the backstory. So why they don't really care? So I think I think one of the things when looking at an adaptation is to tr- try to stay relatively close to the source material initially before you necessarily branch out for the medium you're working in yeah i think as, as i think you're completely right especially with comic book stuff so yeah you know you'd always have a different artist's interpretation of it like mm. batman you'd have the dark knight series that came out and then that looks much different to the 1950s batman you yes. know so uh, absolutely yeah, it's kind of doing that within yeah. Uh, video yeah. games. I, I think that's really important because the, the sort of variations within the theme, you know, Judge Dredd has been drawn differently by different uh, brilliantly talented artists in different ways. There's still an essence of Judge Dredd that we recognise from one art brilliant artist, you know, from modern Henry Flint to the original Carlos Esquerra. You know, there's still the recognisable component of the character. Those are the things you can't throw away, but you can reinterpret it but, you know, for example, the conceit of Dread not taking his helmet off, which is obviously stolen by the Mandalorian to a certain extent, you know, and, and Star Wars, um, you know, that that's an important part of the the character. You don't ever get to see his face. It's just part of it. It's a bit like Superman. You know, Superman disguising himself by wearing glasses is absurd, but it's sort of part of the story and everybody's OK yeah. with that. Well, get back to um, some of your biggest games at Rebellion. I mean, in 2005, that's when we saw the first Sniper Elite game. Mm. And obviously that's turned out to be a massive hit for your company. I mean, why do you think these titles are so beloved and successful? And is that a really important franchise now to Rebellion, I take it? Well, every game we ever do is important. But obviously things like Sniper Elite, we're on five now. Um, uh, you know, it's obviously hugely important and each game we've done has more or less doubled the success of the previous one and the first one was really successful so so yeah hugely important to rebellion as a company but it's also important that we tried different things we tried you know strange brigade was a big success for us the zombie army uh, as a sort of shooter but a bit more tongue-in-cheek with endless hordes of zombies coming at you in a post-apocalyptic sort of period setting that was a great fun to be involved with i really enjoyed that game and lots of other things coming up as well which we haven't announced yet but but a sort of we try to keep a balance between sequels and original new things because we know we, we, we all want more of the same, but we also want new stuff as well. And I think it's important to keep both going as well as you can. But yeah, Sniper Elite, hugely important to us. I think one of the secrets to our success is that both Chris and I, we kind of want to make games that people want to play, which sounds a bit weird, but... I'm interested in making games that somebody will be happy to spend their money on. And after a couple of weekends of playing it, go, yeah, that was, that was great. I really enjoyed that. I'd like some more of that as opposed to a sort of a game that doesn't really entertain them. They feel a bit heated by, Uh, you know, there there are games that we hear a lot about, but they're not really that good when you actually, you know, you sort of play it because you think you ought to not because you're really enjoying it. So I've always liked the idea of making hugely commercial games that are, that are creatively satisfying as well. Um, and as a consequence, actually, we, we do win some awards, but we don't win as many awards as, as I would like, really, because because our games are fairly, as I say, they're, they're, they're fairly sort of 
they're just commercial. They, they, they deliver what it says. I mean, names like Zombie Army, it's like, yeah, I know what that is. I fancy that kind of a game. Uh, so, so naming is really important. We don't want obscure names. We want somebody pick the game off the shelf or you know, have a look at it on the screen and go, cool, that sounds like something I might want to play. Well, in recent years as well, you've been doing some um, virtual reality titles as well. Um, you know, some great titles that you did on the PSVR that I played. I love the, the Battlezone update that you did. Yes. Um, has it been kind of moving into VR then? And do you think you'll be exploring this, this area more? Yeah, absolutely. VR is an interesting space because you have to unlearn some things you've learned about um, video games design and, and, and delivery because it's much more intense than than looking at something on the screen. So we, we, we relearned a lot of stuff with VR. Yeah. I mean, I, I was a bit surprised that VR didn't take off as much as I thought it would do because I think it's brilliant technology. I think it's absolutely wonderful. I thought it would be hugely successful. And it's just successful. What that means is we'll we'll keep doing VR, but we'll also keep doing the sort of non-VR games as well. Uh, we just keep, you know, keep a balance because there's things you can do in VR that you can't do as successfully in, in, in the ordinary space and vice versa. So I think everything, everything has its place from a creative perspective. Yeah, VR also ties in with virtual production because we don't, we're doing quite a lot with LED screens and filming things. So if people are vaguely aware of virtual production that's sort of used on the Star Wars stuff, we did a little short, um, it's called Percival on my, it's on my YouTube channel. If anybody wants to look, it's about five minutes of me in suit of armor, um, with in, in creating a short story in virtual production. And it was an experiment to see how we can use that computer game technology in media like film and telly and of course that's mm. that's very successful now we're working with epic uh, on the unreal engine um with other projects at the moment so yeah super super exciting we're well, talking about battle zone as well i mean how is it updating such an iconic classic game because obviously that game always felt futuristic with those kind of vector graphics you know the wireframe back in the original 1980s version and um, but bringing that into the virtual reality space how was that then? And, uh, and, and I think the that was... uh, 98 version was fantastic as well. They're, they're all really good. I mean, Battlezone is a great brand. We, we sort of bought it. We, we, we own it outright now, which is great. But um, And I was a huge fan of the original. I remember putting lots of 10Ps into the Battlezone cabinet with a, the sort of goggles. Remember, you remember you used to press your head against the goggles and have the two controllers uh, yeah. left and right to, to use it. And I always used to die. could never play the damn game. It was impossible. But, you know, it was great. It was a form of virtual reality. It's just your head was fixed onto the cabinet um, in a way that isn't what virtual reality does now. So for us, it was an obvious tech game, which would be fun to do in VR, because really that's what the original was trying to do, but they didn't have the VR tech. Uh, and so it was absolutely wonderful. We, we learned so much about movement in that game as well, about locking the, locking the horizon uh, steady and not bouncing that up and down. And we learned about how people get seasick and why. Uh, why they get seasick and all that kind of stuff. So it was a really, really interesting uh, project to do. And the great thing is stylized graphics as well. We could really lean into the sort of cyberspace, you know, uh, cyberspace style graphics, which was very exciting. And it lends itself to speed of implementation as well in the game. You know, it worked within the game. But it also worked for the frame rate for the game in VR, which needs to be about 120 frames a second. Are there any other like classic franchises you think would work well in VR? I was wondering what it'd be like to play play something like Pac Man in virtual reality. Scary. Pac-Man is, yeah, <laughs> Pac Man's difficult because yeah, with games like that where you need to have the sort of what what I call the designer view, the sort of god's eye view or the, the the helicopter view of the landscape to plan your movement. But playing Pac Man in in virtual reality, I don't think would work from if it was first person perspective because you lack the information about what's what threats are around what corners and how fast they're moving and all that kind of stuff. I mean, good Pac-Man players, I don't really ever watched YouTube videos of Pac-Man, experienced Pac-Man players. I mean, absolutely amazing how they time things and the, the plans of, of how they move and all that kind of stuff. So it's absolutely astonishing. A bit like watching master Tetris players at work. So it's mesmerizingly <laughs> clever. But um, there are some games, we, we've toyed with the idea of um, doing something like Sniper Elite uh mm. in vr we, we have done that one of the problems for me with vr is it's so immersive does it start to get close to being a simulation of being in real war with all the attendant uh difficulties psychological difficulties that that might bring into it i mean vr is yeah, used in training one. all the time you know vr is used to train pilots and tank crews and all sorts 
um, and and the train squad is in in ordinary uh, infantry fighting. So, yeah, yeah, it was interesting. We got we got a whole bunch of um, going back to sniper elite briefly. We got a whole bunch of requests from uh, British Army uh, because they were they were they were all um, in their rest periods from training. They were all playing sniper elite squad based sniper elite games, which I thought was a bit like a busman's holiday. Really, real soldiers playing our game <laughs> seems a bit weird, but there you go. Yeah, no, you mean that's a fine line, that though, isn't it, between simulation and game, I suppose? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, 30 years in the industry then. I mean, what do you think's been, I know it's a hard question to answer probably, but do you think there's been a secret to Rebellion's longevity? Yeah, make good games, basically. Make mm-hmm. good games uh, and respect the consumer. You know, make, make a game that somebody's going to want to play, not the game you necessarily want to make, if it isn't the sort of game people want to play. I mean, I, I like playing games. I'm, I still. I'm still a big games player, um, and uh, I'm all, I always love playing other people's games because I can I can see them from the perspective of a player, but I can also see them from the perspective of a designer. And I can start I can see I can see past the uh, past the green curtain to the little man on the inside. You know, to quote a, a Wizard of Oz metaphor. I know what they're doing behind the scenes to make it work, and I always think that's really interesting. So I get this sort of full x-ray vision as it were of, of a computer game because i know so much about it and i also know that it's hard to make a good computer game uh, and you've got to you've really got to polish the game as much as you can afford to do before you release it because you get one chance to impress people that the game's worth buying or keeping or playing and um if you screw that up it's hard to get them back you can do it there are games that have launched and been underwhelming and then managed to rescue themselves over time. But it's hard work to do and it's quite soul destroying. So, so I always feel you sort of get one launch and you get one opportunity to impress somebody. And that's what we're always trying to focus down on. Will your average person enjoy that, be able to play this game and enjoy it? And, and that's really what matters to us at the end of the day. Well, interestingly, uh, you're doing a Kickstarter at the moment, and uh, we're from Nottingham, so we love a bit of a you know medieval reference and stuff like that. Um, it's called Leading the Rebellion. Um, can you tell us more about that and uh, yeah, where people you. can back it? Yeah, thank you very much for bringing it up. So, so I've written a book. Um, it's it's a bit of a funny book. It's, it's about chivalry, about the, the 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 guidelines that that guided knights in armor back in the day in the medieval period. It's also about how the chivalric rules apply to modern business, i.e. What, what can you do? What can you learn from the knights of old about how to run a business, how to live your life? And it's a little bit of autobiography because there are elements in it where I talk about my past and what I did as a kid and, and how I came into making computer games and that kind of stuff, much like some of the things we talked about here. And it's a sort of a combination of all of that. And it's called Leading the Rebellion. It's on Kickstarter at the moment. It's going to be published in a traditional way through the through the Rebellion Publishing um, book company um, but I also have because of the YouTube channel Modern History TV slightly weirdly named I know but Modern History TV is the thing I present it's all about medieval history actually medieval knights in armor and horses and uh, jousting and that kind of thing and um, I'm doing a kickstarter there because some people have said they wanted a special edition they wanted signed editions and special editions of the book so I'm kind of that's that's there for them it's on kickstarter just look up leading the rebellion by me Jason Kingsley I love the fact that in the book as well, you're kind of spinning that to how it can be applied to modern day life and business as well. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, you know, things, things, things like wisdom. So wisdom was mm. considered a nightly trait. So, and wisdom today, you know, is this a good business decision? Is this a good decision for the business? Or should I think about it a little bit more? What will it mean if we do this as a business? What will it mean if I do this in my life? You know, if I want, to, if I want to be a doctor, say I'm at school and I want to be a doctor, I've got to follow a path. I've got to follow a certain path of education to make it easier for me to become a doctor. If I want to be an entrepreneur, I don't have to have the same kind of qualifications because you can be an entrepreneur without any official qualifications, but you do need qualifications to be a doctor or a lawyer, that kind of thing. So if you know your destination, you can plan for it. And uh, and, and that's part of wisdom and training. Honor, do, doing honor, so paying bills on time, you know, keeping the money flowing, you know, Honouring business deals, doing what you say uh, is really important. Fighting when you have to. Uh, I don't mean literally grabbing a sword and, and slaughtering your, your business enemies, at all, <laughs> of, course, of course. But I do mean sometimes standing up for your rights, You know, maybe taking somebody to court, 
maybe having legal arguments with them and and doing the right thing you don't do that spuriously but you do it if you have to and then you know looking after people so looking after the staff your colleagues and people that work for you as best you can and expect them to do the same expect them to look after you as well i mean some of it some of it didn't map across particularly well you know there was a, no, quite a lot of there's quite a lot of attitudes towards women which probably need to be abandoned so i talk about how the chivalric code isn't a masculine thing necessarily it was back then but it isn't now that the, the principles of chivalry should be applied equally to all uh, and by all uh, that kind of stuff um so yeah it was um it was fun trying to map them across they don't they don't map exactly but there are some interesting things one could learn about how to live one's life yeah, sounds like a really interesting read, and I'm sure a lot of people will take a lot from that book. Uh, and if you want to get a hold of it, it is running right now at the time this episode comes out. Around three weeks left on the Kickstarter, so I'll put a link in our show notes so people can there uh, click directly through, and that's uh, your YouTube channel as well. And it's been fascinating talking to you, Jason. Thank you so much for coming on and reminiscing with us, and uh, here's to another 30 years of rebellion. Thank you, guys. My pleasure. The, the hour has gone incredibly quickly. I appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers.